Now, the synagogue of Satan is going to be established here, sadly enough. As you go through the seven churches, you're going to see the establishment of the synagogue of Satan. And how many parts to the synagogue of Satan? Three. Three. That's right, because it's a symbol of the kingdom. So you'll notice, and I'm, I'm kind of jumping on you, but if you go to the Church of Philadelphia, which is the second to the last church, because now we're dealing with the second church, you'll notice also that it mentions the synagogue of Satan. So it, when you remember the remember that chiastic structure I showed you, the synagogue of Satan is mentioned in the Church of Smyrna. It's also mentioned in the Church of Philadelphia, because that those are the two parts of the synagogue. Remember the, the two lampstands, there's two lampstands in the synagogue. In the center of the two lampstands is the ark that controls the scrolls. So you can have the synagogue of Satan here in Smyrna. You can have a synagogue of Satan in the Church of Philadelphia. And then the, in the midst, you're going to have Satan's throne. Because the throne is always in the in the in the midst or the, the apex of the structure. Are you with me? So so what's actually happening is. Christ is telling us that the church is going to fall away. That's what we saw in Ephesus last time. They're going to fall. Same thing that happened in Genesis. And then Satan is going to establish his kingdom within the church. The same yeah. thing he did to the Jew with the Jews. This is the same thing that's going to happen to the to the mm -hmm. Christianity, Christian to the Christian church. And of course, we already know this because when we get further in Revelation, in Revelation 17, we're going to see this harlot and a woman represents the church, and she's riding the Dragon. she's riding this dragon right so we see the church connected to the dragon when the church is supposed to be faithful to her husband which is the bridegroom and that of course breaks us back takes us back to revelation 12 so so revelation the the message to churches of uh, seven churches of revelation is actually giving us the same pattern that the rest of the book of revelation is actually giving us any questions about that does that make sense mm -hmm. And, and what's the only way, what's the only way for those of us who are slaves of Satan's kingdom to have life? Jesus. In order to have life, we have to choose Jesus. Right. And what is a symbol of choosing Jesus? Having no fear. Death our, process. Being faithful. Our first love. A death process. Yes, it's the death, the baptism, the death, and then life, right? Yes. yes. It's the death and then life process is what brings us out of Satan's kingdom into God's kingdom. So he when he when he uses this death to life process, he's actually ex trying to explain to us because the attributes of Christ are the are the medicine that that church needs to heal to heal its disease. So if you're a slave to fear, the only way, the only way to become to be freed from being a slave to fear and be part of Christ's kingdom is to die and be born again, to, to pass from death to life. And of course, baptism is that symbol that we use from, from passing from death to life, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why oh. it uses the death to life, <laughs> the death and life symbol connected with the here with the church of Smyrna, because for us to be set free from our fears, we need to die to self. We need to die to that fear. We need to be born again. Remember, this is in John 12, right before Jesus uh, goes to the cross. Remember, he says, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains a single seed. But if it dies, then what happens? It's reborn. Reborn. It, it bears much fruit. It gives life. So the only way to give life is to die. Of course, this is what Jesus was teaching, right? And then, of course, the next verse after that, he says that that those who love me will follow me, that where I am, there my servant will also be. Well, actually, he uses, I'm sorry, I jumped a verse. He says, those who love their life in this world will lose it, but those who hate their life in this world will gain it for eternal life. Mm -hmm. And then he uses the phrase that those who love me will, will follow me, and where I am, there my servant will also be. In other words, what Jesus is doing his servants will be doing. And this is John 12. What's Jesus going to be doing? He, well, he's, surrendering his, he's surrendering his will to the Father continually, like we need to surrender our will to him. That's right. And the kernel of wheat falling to the ground and dying that he's talking about is actually his yes. death on the cross and his resurrection. 
So the idea of following him, if we if we're his followers, then we're supposed to be where he is. And where is he? Well, he's in John 12, he's going to die, and then he's going to be resurrected. And he's telling us as his followers, if you if you are truly my followers, then you must die to this world and you must be resurrected or born again. We would use that phrase. So, so this is what he's actually telling the church of Smyrna. This is the experience they need to be set free. So verse so verse 10 then is is really present tense for us today be thou faithful yes. unto death and i will give thee a crown of life mm -hmm. yes yeah that's right and by and the way he, go ahead oh i was just yeah i was just gonna say when in verse eight these things say at the first and the last which was dead and is alive that's jesus right yes okay absolutely so similar to <clears throat> the church of ephesus to return to one's first love um, is to go and hear the voice of God, the thunder, and in doing so, there is a death process. Yes, that's right. That's right. And I, I like to say, I like to say it backwards on purpose to get people's attention. We say lose your first love. Well, the idea is that you lose love being the first principle, right? So that that. It, it kind of helps, kind of clicks your mind maybe in a different way to get to see that that you're functioning by a different principle other than God's principle, of course, which is himself, right? So, yes. Now, what's interesting here is that the, the tribulation is 10 days, right? Yes. So the tribulation is 10 days and that they're going to be tried. It says, verse 10, that you shall be tried and you shall have tribulation 10 days. So what does that remind you of? the ten kingdoms okay what else does that remind you of what specifically in the bible am i going to take you to that there was a just there the was just a, there was just a great fall and then someone is taken captivity in captive tap into captivity and then they're tested for 10 days who was that the three Daniel and his buddies. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So you can see that the that Jerusalem has fallen. By the way, in Ephesus, they've fallen, right? He says that they have fallen. They left their first love. So in verse five, he says, Remember from whence thou art fallen. So in, in Daniel chapter one, Jerusalem falls. And then Daniel and his friends are taken into captivity. So that's what we've been talking about. They're slaves of so just as Smyrna is slaves to fear, and they're going to be tested or tried for 10, 10 days. And they're and and if they're faithful in the little test, then they will be then they will be proved faithful in the in the bigger test that will come, right? And that's so, the, oh. go, go ahead. And that's the 10 days of affliction in the in the day of atonement before the day yes. of yeah, well, right. The Feast of Trumpets in preparation for the Day of Atonement. That's that's correct. Ten days. So, so that ten days specifically, re specifically is a reference back to the same experience that Daniel and his friends are going through in Daniel chapter one, which is a a testing or a trying period. And of course, that's exactly what it says here that they're going to be tried or tested for ten days. So there's this is a test. Uh, the, the God's people are being tested in the little things to to see if they'll be faithful in in the big things, right? So that that's uh, I think it's very insightful for the Church of Smyrna that is connecting that to that time. Now I know that most of what we're talking about in our thinking we're thinking historically, which is fine, but at some point we're going to begin to realize that the seven messages to the seven churches is actually talking about the experience that God's people are going to go through in the time of the judgment of the living. And it's describing all, all different seven characteristics or seven different groups of people and their different characteristics within those groups that are going to go through that time of trouble or the tribulation, the judgment of the living at the end. So we've looked at it historically and most of us are talking about it historically, but actually all seven churches are co happening contemporaneously at the same time. It's at the end. And God's people, all of us, will fit into one of those personality groups or one of those church groups. 
So it's actually just talking to us individually as well as describing a process.